Jade Alejandro Mace is a community herbalist based in Western Massachusetts. She started studying herbs formally in 2005, coming from a background in botany, and has been intertwined with them ever since. And she also has a background rich in Chinese medicine. Ayurveda and Western herbalism in the vitalist and wise woman traditions and brings this diversity and breadth of knowledge to her teaching and clinical practice. Her focus is on self and community empowerment, equal access, local plants, simple and easy remedies, and the sharing and spreading of herbal knowledge. She teaches herbalism avidly throughout New England and leads an apprenticeship and class series in bioregionalism, um, herbalism. She has also been an herbal educator with Herb Farm since 2015. Jade sees folks in her clinical practice for herbal consultations, both in her private practice and the Blue Dragon Community Herbal Clinic in Greenfield, Massachusetts, a clinic dedicated to affordable herbal care. Her writings have been published in the Journal of the Northeast Herbal Association, the Herbstock blog, Birthing Mama Online Holistic Pregnancy Program, and the Birth Institute's Birth Wisdom blog. So she comes with a great deal of experience and knowledge and is going to share some of that with us today in a talk that she's called Garden Herbs in Folk Art. Ooh. But she's going to start with some garden herbs. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks, everyone. So that was a good introduction. Yeah, I'm Jane. Uh, I live in Shootsbury. And I've lived in this area for a really long time. I went to UMass and studied botany there. And then my interest in plant medicine kind of grew from there. So um, as she said, I practice up in Greenfield. And I just added hours in Northampton, so I'm really excited. So I offer herbal consultations for health. And then bioregional herbalism is, uh, which I offer an apprenticeship in and just a class series. It's the study of plants from our own bioregion. And it doesn't necessarily have to be an endemic species for us to work with it. It could be something like dandelion or plantain, things that were actually brought here by colonists that are now um, pretty much made themselves at home. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I'd say the dandelion. Yes, uh, that weren't from here originally. But so, And we'll talk about a few of those plants, too, as we go. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of what I'm inspired by. And uh, today, so we're going to start off by talking a little bit about the quilt behind you. So this is, um, if you read the little uh, kind of placard there about it, it's, there's a lot of unknowns about this quilt. It's a bit of a mystery. And originally when George and I were talking, we were thinking, let's talk a little bit about some of the plants on here. So I've scoped it out. And the kind of main medicinal plant on there that we can talk about is rose. So if you, you can see the rose right here. Um, this is the rose. <coughs> and I don't think I should touch it because it's really old, but you can see the rose here and mm -hmm. here. There's also a lot of fruit trees and there's grapes lining the bottom. So the rose we're going to talk about first, just because it's just, you know, a lot of people think about rose and they think of, you know, a symbol of love, right? And interestingly, rose actually also has a physical effect on the heart, a positive physical effect on the heart. So in herbalism, we actually work with rose a lot for um, cardiovascular issues, but we also work with it for uh, emotional issues as well. So in Western herbalism, which there are many branches of herbalism, which you heard mentioned a little bit in the biography, but Chinese herbalism comes from China, Ayurveda, comes from India, Western herbalism comes from Europe and was um, has Greek and Roman roots to it. So, um, so anyway, but Western herbalism, we categorize herbs based on what we call their herbal actions. And an herbal action, it could be um, anything. So interestingly, it shares some terminology with Western medicine. And in fact, Western medicine is taking that from uh, those deeper Greco-Roman roots. But an example of an herbal action that's shared with, um, with Western medicine would be, say, an antispasmodic, right? Antispasmodics, they reduce spasming in the muscles. They build their muscle relaxant, for example. Anti-inflammatory, some herbs have the herbal action of being an anti-inflammatory. A really well-known one um, these days is turmeric, right? Turmeric's getting a lot of good press mm -hmm. for that. So there are other herbal actions that are just their own. They're just kind of specific to herbalism. And an example of one of those is a nervine. And nervine, you could probably infer, 
has a lot to do with the nerves and the nervous system. So rose is a supreme nervine. And nervines are herbs that are nourishing, generally nourishing, and also calming to the nervous system. So if you take a smell of rose, what, who here has just stuck their face in a rose <laughs> at all? Great. How do you feel afterwards? Nice. nice. Yeah, yeah, you feel good. Yeah. You're practicing very basic aromatherapy, <laughs> right? Aromatherapy is the practice of using essential oils to alter your health, you know, for the better. And rose is full of essential oils and, in fact, is very, very calming and relaxing. But it also is kind of uplifting, right? So in herbalism, we actually use rose for depression. We also use it for anxiety, um, just nervousness in general, sort of emotional um, sensitivity uh, in the sense that you're easily stressed out or easily brought to anxiety. And it really can have a, a deeply calming effect on the mind. And those essential oils are what you're smelling when you smell the rose. So that's kind of a, a really mm. nice example. You smell it, you feel relaxed, and also a little bit uplifted, right? So that's, you know, we also use it for sort of the emotional part, like I was mentioning. And in fact, we do, of course, give rose as a symbol of love, right? And a lot of these things that are sort of practiced in traditions, I, it's one of my favorite things, actually, when we back up um, tradition and we scientifically validate it, right? And rose is a great example of that. Other ways um, that we use rose just specifically for the cardiovascular system is it is cooling um, and all herbs have um, energetics to them. So meaning an herb could be warming and a great example of that is cayenne or ginger, right? It's spicy, it's warming. Um, so it can be like the scale of energetics with herbs. It could be hot like cayenne, it could be warm like let's say uh, basil is a little bit warming. It could just be kind of neutral. They're not usually neutral, but they can be. And then it can be cool or cold. And um, bitter herbs tend to be cooling, so dandelion's a nice cooling herb. And then herbs that are super, super bitter are cold. And rose is on that cool spectrum. And a lot of times folks that are dealing with things like high blood pressure, for example, they run hot. They're running really hot. So something like rose can have a cooling effect and actually bring down some inflammation. So rose is a good example of that for the cardiovascular system. We'll often put it in there for folks, especially if their blood pressure is tied to stress, which often it is, you know. You can, you can, you can observe that pretty well. If someone's very stressed out and they just went through a really um, stressful thing, their blood pressure spikes. So in any case, rose would be a really good one for the cardiovascular system when it seems like some of the issues are tied to chronic stress or anxiety. Um, so anyway, so that's a little bit about rose. There's a lot of ways to work with rose. There's a wild rose that grows around here that some of you might be familiar with. It's Rosa multiflora oh, is yeah. the oh, Latin yeah. name. It's the one you tear out. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And I am like on a personal mission to teach people that it's actually medicine. <laughs> um, certainly there's like a time and a place where you're like, okay, I love you, Rose, but this is just not the spot for you. It'll grow in with your cultivated roses. Yeah. You know, it will. <laughs> It'll just kind of try to creep in there. Rosa multiflora is endemic to China, Japan, East Asia. It was brought here as wildlife fodder in like I think about the 50s because of all the abundant rose hips and it's um, food for birds and mammals and just all the overwintering animals. So that's why it was brought here originally and certain plants are more opportunistic than others, right? And that's my kind of like switch that I make. I don't really refer to plants as invasives. Um, I think it's a little bit anthropomorphizing them a little too much, right? They're not like invading, but they are opportunistic, right? Meaning some plants do really well with uh, essentially like the, the um, I guess you could say the conditions that humans create, which is disturbance. We create disturbance in the landscape. You know, we make roads, we make gardens, we make paths, all of that. And multiflora rose, which is the common name for Rosa multiflora, um, is one that really likes that disturbed landscape. It'll come right in there, and you'll see it along edges of fields, etc. all of that. So it's very opportunistic, but it can be used extremely medicinally. So if you were to go to, say, an herb shop, um, you know, where I practice in Greenfield, Blue Dragon Apothecary, it's right on Main Street upstairs, above where World Eye Books used to be, but it's right by the co-op. It's, um, it's right up there. You'll see a little placard on the sidewalk. You can walk in there, and there's just jars and jars of herbs. And there's also a great herb shop in Northampton, Acadia Herbals, in Pelham, um, the Bauer Studio. 
In any case, you can win. You can buy your mint, you can buy a rose, and the rose you'll see is generally rose petals or rose buds. Mm -hmm. And often the rose species that's used is Rosa damascena, so the, um, Damascus rose is a really famous one. But really, like any rose will work. The more hybridized it is, the less uh, medicinal it is. But <laughs> isn't that funny? You know, the more we domesticate it. But you know, it, you want it to have an aroma. Like, there are some really beautiful roses out there, and then you go and you smell them, and they actually don't smell yeah, like anything. Right, right. So that's kind of like, you know, using your senses there. Anyway, so you can go and you can buy your rose petals, or if you have profuse amounts of rose and you want to work with it, you can just go and you can clip those flowering clusters in the spring, and you can make tea with them. You can dry them for sachets or potpourri. Um, they, they dry pretty well, you know, just like in a basket, just um, in a dry place. It can't be a room that gets a little musty. Um, it has to be a, a cool, dry place. But And the plant material has to be dry when you harvest it. So don't pick it in the morning when there's dew or else it will mold on you. But yeah, you can use it for all those things. Rose petals are also edible, right? So you can put them in salads or make jams with them. Uh, I love to make like a rose sugar. That's a really fun thing to do with the rose. You just take the rose petals and the buds, and you can, um, and I guess when I say buds, I mean calyx. So botanically, that's the little part of the, do I have any flowers here? Here's, here's a, let's see, I have a, um, this is a nasturtium. And do you see, I'll pass this around so you can see, but do you see how there's the lighter orange petals going around? That's called the calyx, that's what surrounds the flower. So you can use the rose petal, like the whole flower, plus the calyx, you can use all of that. And what you do is you just put it in a jar, you put a layer of sugar on the bottom of it, and then you do a layer of the rose flowers. And you know, and like I one layers, I mean, you know, a half an inch to an inch, then another layer of the sugar, and you, um, and you top it with a layer of sugar. And then you let it all sit for a while. I mean, it'll be ready to use in a couple of weeks, but the longer you let it sit, the more like syrupy it gets. And then you can strain it out. You might have to like crush it up a little because it'll harden because the uh, sugar is like absorbing the moisture. But then you got rose flavored sugar and that's awesome. That's really, really nice. So you can like sprinkle it on cookies or use it in like your tea or something like that. So that's a really fun way to use it. And remember, whenever you're doing that, you're also accessing that nice heart opening, relaxing kind of aspect of the rose because you are, it is still slightly medicinal. Another way to use that if you're not into sugar is you can just do the same thing with honey. You can just, and in that case, you don't even have to layer it. You can just put the rose petals in a jar. It has to be a dry jar. And the roses, again, can't have dew. Cover it with honey. I like to use local raw honey. Mix it all up. Make sure it's thoroughly coated. You're not gonna have a layer of honey on the top. You're still gonna have the rose petals kind of covered in the honey because it's, it'll be impossible to get a layer of honey on the top. It'll always float up. But as long as those rose petals are covered in the honey, honey is super preservative, right? They found like honey in like King Tut's tomb, right? Like 2,000 <laughs> years ago or something. So um, anyway, it will, it'll preserve it and then you've got rose honey and you can just eat the roses, they become candied on their own, or you can gently warm it like in a warm water bath and strain it out. So those are some nice ways to use rose. Um, and I encourage us all to become friends with Rosa Multiflora. And these are garden roses that are on here, but I, I love that there's rose on here, that it's like aside from the fruits, it's actually really the main recognizable plant. And I think it just speaks again to sort of our culture's relationship with Rose and how long we've had that relationship with Rose. It's, you know, it's it sort of uh, hits us in all places, the body, mind, spirit. Rose hits all those areas when you work with it. So that's Rose, work with it. So it sounds like a lot of these people, a lot of you, um, I was gonna say a lot of these people, but a lot of you <laughs> um, have seen Rose and Multiflora, maybe? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's just the wild rose. And I really encourage you, it's what blooms in like June, you, now it's making rose hips, which are also edible. Um, you don't wanna eat the seeds of the rose hip, but you can nibble the outside or you could use like a food mill to make a rose hip jam or something. Very, very, very high in vitamin C, like extremely high in vitamin C. So it provides all, all year. And one neat thing about this quilt that we can think about botanically is actually, Pretty much all these fruits are in the um, Rosaceae family. So, you know, in, in botany, you've got your different plant families, and family Rosaceae actually contains rose, obviously, but also a bunch of our familiar fruits peaches, pears, apples, 
plums, apricots. The stone fruits, pretty much, are in the rose family. And we really can think of the rose hips. They're just another fruit. They're just a, a little fruit. So, yeah, so work with rose. You can make tea from the rose hips, too. So, anyway. I love that it's on there just because it really does show our kind of history with with the rose. Anyone have any questions about rose? Yeah. You said don't eat the seeds. What is that? Because they they will uh, totally irritate your stomach. The seeds okay. of the rose hips. Yeah, they're used um, in like aesthetics and stuff. Um, not aesthetics. What am I thinking of? Just like beauty. You can actually rose hip seed oil is a very mm -hmm. famous good restorative for your skin. So something you could do is you could take those rose hips and actually soak them in a really nice oil, like say jojoba oil. And that's a way to kind of extract some of the seeds from the rose hips. It's not going to be the same as if you were to like buy a rose hip seed oil from like Dr. Hauschka or something. They're going to have a better way of extracting. But yeah, but the seeds they'll irritate your stomach. They're not, you know, poisonous on the scale that it would certainly not like kill you or anything like that. It would just be an irritant. Yeah, who else? Any other questions about rose? No? no? Okay. So I, oh, yeah. Well, I've always heard that uh, rose hips were one of the things that the sailors would take on the um, extended yeah. voyages. Have you heard of that? Um, is that documented or is that just. You know, I've never or? heard that, but that makes so much sense to me because of the vitamin C and preventing scurvy. So that would be why they were doing that because they're very rich. I mean, they're way higher in vitamin C than oranges. You know, and we always think of oranges as like the really high vitamin C thing. So, yeah, and you can make a tea, and they're really tasty. Mm -hmm. They are sour. You know, they're just a little bit sour. Mm -hmm. So that would make a lot of sense. I hadn't heard that, though. Mm -hmm. But, again, I love it when that's a good example of sort of tradition being validated modern with modern science when we learn about the, the deeper sort of nutritional value of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Are any, are any roses like endemic to the U.S. or are they all brought There in? are. There are a lot of endemic species of rose, yeah. Um, there's one that grows in the East Coast, Rosa virginiana, um, which is really lovely. And you'll see it sometimes interspersed with Rosa rugosa on the beach. So Rosa rugosa is the beach rose that is like, you know, all lining the cape, gets the big fat rose hips. That one is also um, endemic to Japan, China, kind of East Asia. Oh. but. Um, but there is also, you'll sometimes see the endemic rose, the Rosa Virginiana, and then that one also will grow more inland, like I've seen it growing in Leverett. Um, but you'll also, especially in like the Rocky Mountain West and the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of endemic species of roses. So, yeah. Oh yeah, you probably see a lot of different roses. Yes. see, yes. Totally, yeah, so there are, there's a lot of, yeah, roses, pretty fairly distributed throughout the temperate regions of the planet. Anybody else? Rose? Cool. All right, let's see what we're doing with time. Cool, so we have a little bit more time. So what I did also is I thought I'd just grab a few things from the garden because there's a really nice historical garden out here. And, you know, these are all things that sort of, if we're thinking within a historical context, that, you know, colonists would have been working with here. So one that's really fun to talk about is nasturtium. So this is a really common garden flower, and you saw that the flower went around. So how many folks here knew you could eat nasturtium? Oh, yeah. Yay, good, good, good. And does anyone, what's the taste? Peppery. It's totally peppery. So I will pass these around and you're, you're welcome to, um, thank you, and I'll pass the flowers. So too. sweet. Yeah, and you're welcome to take a little, you know, tear off a little bit of um, oh, really? the leaf if you want. Sure, they're just from the garden, so, you know, I mean, I didn't wash them or anything, yeah, so we don't closure. Them, so. We if don't you, spray them either. If, so. Yeah, but if you're one of those folks who's like, you know, the most probably get on there are some probiotics, so there's a little bit of soil washed on them. The soil's full of probiotics. You know, we go to Whole Foods and we buy, like, our $30 ball of probiotics in the soil it's teeming with them so I'm of the opinion that if you know you don't wash your vegetables when you get them from your CSA if you get a little dirt it's good for your gut flora so that's great but anyway it's peppery and uh, it's great you know I talked about the energetics of herbs as in you know the temperature scale but there's also the five flavors to think about right so the five flavors that we're looking for in foods are bitter sweet 
which are the, um, you know, salt, salty, so sweet and salty are the two that we're most familiar with in, in our modern culture, but bittersweet, salty, um, sour, and pungent. And pungent falls into that spicy family um, of tastes. So nasturtium is very pungent. And different flavors exert different effects on our physiology. Like the bitter flavor, for example, stimulates um, digestive secretions. So digestive enzymes, bile, that's all actually physiologically when we taste that taste, that sends a message to the body to start secreting those things. So the pungent flavor, um, which is that spicy flavor that you get in the nasturtium, is actually really good for digestion. So it kind of invigorates things. It is indeed actually warming to the body. And really, you want to think about kind of like colonial fare. And <laughs> um, really, the spices and the culinary herbs were really, really important. And we don't think of nasturtium as a culinary herb these days, but it definitely was used in that way. Because, you know, especially in the winter, which if you start to eat a little bit seasonal, you start to realize it's kind of heavy fare, right? Like I have a winter CSA from Brookfield Farm in Amherst, and it's root veggies, straight up, you know? Like in the beginning, we're lucky because we get like some leeks and onions, which are also pungent, right? Onions, garlic, that's a pungent flavor, that's spicy. But as the winter goes on, it's pretty much like potatoes, beets, turnips, celeriac. So if you're just eating a plate of, say, turnips, right? You're gonna digest it, obviously, but if you had throw in there some dried nasturtium leaves or say any of the culinary herbs that we commonly think of, like rosemary, thyme, basil, oregano, they're warming and they're spicy. They're also kind of drying. They're gonna invigorate digestion. They actually do stimulate digestion, that, that spicy flavor. They aid nutrient absorption. Um, and they also, if you think about, again, energetics, they're countering the energetics of the terrain in the winter. Because the winter in New England, specifically, it's cold and damp, right? <laughs> New England in general actually is a cold and damp environment. Right. Overall, it is. Um, and so it's, so what you wanna do to counter that, so Qatar, if you read like old, or like old uh, historical accounts, you might hear of someone who like died of Qatar or like just deal with that. So Qatar, it's spelled C-A-T-T, -T, I think A-R-H. Mm -hmm. Qatar is just congestion, it's like mucus congestion. Qatar um, is kind of an old-fashioned word for mucus, and Qatar can settle in the lungs, right? When you have like a wet cough, you can have upper respiratory Qatar, which looks like a lot of us suffering from like the late season ragweed allergies right now. So anyway, you're really prone to that in the winter, and including a warm, drying spice will help to counter the cold, damp environment too. That's another <laughs> way. So really, a lot of these um, culinary herbs were really a part of um, not just sort of helping to increase the flavors of food, which is like an obvious benefit, they're also part of a sort of food as medicine that was just kind of incorporated. And we, we do that today, but we've kind of lost that a little bit. Like we don't realize that when you put sage in your, um, you know, your winter squash, that that's actually helping to increase, um, increase digestive force. And then the other piece to think about is those essential oils again. So this gets back to um, the aromas. So whenever something has an aroma, like all those culinary herbs, they contain essential oils, also known as volatile oils. And quite broadly, volatile oils or essential oils, they, they are broad spectrum antimicrobials. And that's very well studied. So that's something you can look up. And essential oils tend to have, so when I say antimicrobial, that means it could be um, show um, good effects against viruses, bacteria, or fungi. Those are all kind of categorized as, um, as microbes. And those essential oils are antimicrobial. So again, then you're increasing your chance of fighting off a pathogen or a bug. And a, a good example of thinking about this is the closer you get to the equator, the spicier the food gets, right. meaning there's more cayenne, there's more basil, there's more ginger, which are all very, very rich in essential oils. And that's, a, that's sort of a, a way to look back and see, well, the closer you get to the equator, the less refrigeration there is, the more chance there is of foodborne pathogens, right? And we're countering that by putting those things in our food. But we can just do that ourselves. So nasturtium is a great example, and it's surely a way that historically this plant was used. So another one that's aromatic, since I guess we're talking about aromatics, is catmint. So this one is so lovely. Um, 
<laughs> just stick your face in there. <laughs> um, you could taste it if you want, but I did just put it in my face, so I understand yeah. if you don't. But there's a lot out in the garden. So, yeah, so that's um, the genus Nepeta, and I'm forgetting the species, but it's quite related to catnip. So catnip is Nepeta cataria, and this is Nepeta something else, I don't remember. But the cat mint is another one that's going to aid digestion. Yeah, doesn't that smell nice? So you can make a tea with that, just a nice gentle digestive tea. You could also use it if you have a little bit of a stomach bug because it's very aromatic. You smell those, you know, the aromatic volatile oils. So again, that's a sign generally that it's going to aid digestion and also have a little bit of antimicrobial or immune boosting effects as a way to think about it. So that was probably, you know, likely used as sort of an after dinner digestive tea to use for bloating, gas, indigestion in general. Um, and there's um, an, another kind of, we're thinking in the historical context, uh, an old word that was used for this was biliousness. You guys know that? Have you yeah. seen that? Like in the historical? So bilious, it's B-I-L-I-O-U-S, bilious and the ness, which is a kind of an old fashioned word for indigestion. And this would be used, something like catnip would be used for, the, for biliousness. It could also look like heartburn or um, just sort of acid reflux. And again, the bitter aromatic herbs generally really help with that because they're increasing digestive secretions, which are going to help you digest your food better. Yes. Yeah. Is the mint still, or the, the effects of mint still available in mint jelly? You know, a little bit, yeah. yes, a little kind of bit. It's interesting to think about mint yeah. jelly and roast lamb totally. together. Absolutely. You know, well, sauce. that's yeah. an excellent example so really of greasy. your, what's yeah. that? Yes. Roast lamb is very greasy. Exactly. Yeah. So again, these are, you know, these things are woven into our food traditions, but it's just that we have to remember, you know, so exactly. Mm -hmm. So mint does help to offset the heaviness of eating like a meat. Your dinner mints. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, and there's a few like peppermint is kind of still in our culture a little bit. Chamomile, mm -hmm. uh, it's more intact in Europe. If you go to Europe, you'll often have like lime, uh, lime tree tea, which is actually linden, mm. um, tilia species, but they call it lime, but it's, it's not actually lime. Common names are really confusing. <laughs> But uh, that's a, yeah, but the mint is a great example. Of course, if you're adding a bunch of sugar to your mint tea or to your um, your mint jelly, <laughs> jelly yeah. you're gonna lose a little bit of that effect, you know. But like I made some, I made like a Greek meatloaf recently, and it was lamb plus ground beef, um, but it called for a bunch of mint leaf to it, and I just used spearmint from my garden, and that worked great, and it definitely helps to offset potentially indigestion from just eating a bunch of heavy meat. It's like the mint and tabbouleh, that's the yeah. area of the world. They yeah. used a lot of mint because they used a lot of greasy meat. Totally, <laughs> exactly. And a lot of these things just sort of developed to kind of, you know, deal with what you had on hand. You know, what kind of foods were available to you, what plants grow readily for you. Um, another neat aromatic one to talk about is tansy. Oh, yeah. So. Tansy is a, tansy's not really a culinary herb. It's almost like too powerful, but this is another way that these were used was as strewing herbs. Have you ever heard of a strewing herb? Yeah. So a strewing herb was something that was used um, literally, quite literally, you strew it all over the ground, like in your house. So like a really common example of this goes back even farther to like colonial America, but more even to we're thinking like medieval times with like castles and stuff. Like talk about like dank, damp, stagnant, right, like the air. And we know, actually, it's actually very well studied that if you were to burn an aromatic plant in the air, it actually kills something like 99% of like airborne pathogens. It's really amazing. Wow. It's really, really cool. And then again, think historical context and the burning of frankincense and myrrh in churches. And think about lots of people packed together. Great time to pass bugs around. If you're fumigating the air, <laughs> With frankincense and myrrh, which are both highly antimicrobial, it's a way that you're actually have, helping to counter that. So totally, it's really interesting. But another way to do that is just throw the stuff all over the floors. You walk on them, you release the essential oils, and again, you are um, helping to sort of purify the air. So tansy was a great example of one of those. And then more um, sort of in colonial times, they were used, um, you would just hang them up and have them around. And tansy is famous, famous for repelling flies. So, you know, 
think about that for sort of harvest season or um, like a slaughterhouse or any anywhere where you're really not wanting that kind of vermin. Tansy's famous for that, and it is the essential oils. Also repels moths. So, yeah. You have a question? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and that's a really famous one. It also is anti-parasitic internally. So it's a very strong herb. It's not one that you really want to work with without maybe like working with an actual herbalist. Like you'd want to come see someone for a consultation. Um, and tansy really has fallen out of favor in modern herbalism, but it is one that would have been used um, for worms, tapeworm, you could use it topically for ringworm. It, it has uh, just a really good effect against parasites. So, and you know, um, back in the day, we didn't have access to the drugs we have today. And that's kind of the biggest point to think about here is that botanical medicine is what folks were using up until pretty much like the 1950s, 40s, <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and modern medicine has grown out of this. So, yeah, so I think, I want to be aware of our time. I went about five minutes over, so it's 12.50. <laughs> <laughs> it was a half, right? It goes to 12.45, yeah. 12 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, so does anyone have any questions about any of that? Yeah. Have you uh, researched uh, herbs as dyes? I personally haven't, but there are so many wonderful people doing awesome work on botanical dyes. Yeah, it's just so <laughs> cool and fun. Um, there's a lot of plants you can use as mordants, so mordant is like what fixes the dyes. Mm -hmm. And certainly I would say, like, I know this really cool, this quilt is dyed with That's botanicals, yeah. which is yeah. so yeah. cool That's to me. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of folks that are really kind of, there's like a nice kind of folk revival of that within the herbal world. Um, and I've seen articles about it. And so I think, yeah, I personally haven't just because life and time, <laughs> but it's fascinating to me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even the dyes, you can't see it, but there's a silk um, memorial piece yeah. that's from the early 19th century in those colors. Yeah. yeah, like the goldenrod. I know goldenrod that's all over the place right now. That's a dye. That's one you can use. Silk takes the dye so well. Mm -hmm. What's that? And silk takes the dye. Oh, does it? Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, that makes sense. So, it depends on what the fabric you're working with. Yeah. Yeah. Now that I'm in my 70s, every time I scratch myself outside, I can't stop the bleeding. Mm. What's the herbal solution? Damn skin. Damn skin, yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, the number one best plant to kind of stop bleeding topically is yarrow. Uh, oh. Yeah, do you want to know yarrow? Yeah. It'll work yeah. immediately. Um, really? Yeah. So you just slap that bleeding It's hemostatic. Oh. Yeah, it oh. has coagulants in it. So what you do is you want to make, um, well, there's two ways to do it. You can do a spit poultice, which is kind of like gross, but it's, you know, the classic way. You only put a spit poultice on yourself, obviously. Don't put your own spit poultice on someone else. But you would just take a few yarrow leaves and chew them up, put it right on there, stop the bleeding, like pretty immediately. Or you could, um, but you know, if you're bleeding, obviously you don't always have the time for this, but you could kind of mash it up a little bit, like in a mortar and pestle with a little water. That'll work great. That'll work really, really good. Oh, yeah, very yes. common weed from Europe, brought here yeah. by the so colonists. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Well, we have so. another two minutes. I mean, if you want to oh, talk. Another two minutes? If we can give you two more minutes for two more plants. <laughs> oh, OK. Sure, let's do it. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the geranium. Yeah. Yeah. It's ladies mantle. Oh, right. You know ladies mantle? Yeah. Alchemia. So this one gets beautiful dewdrops. In, um, yeah. And so it's Alchemia, right? Like Alchemist, that's the Latin name. Alchemia, um, what is it? Genus is Alchemia. I'm not remembering Latin names great today. But when we say Alchemia, it is referring to Alchemist and Alchemy. And in fact, mm -hmm. there's this cool lore of this plant that those dewdrops that it collects were used by the alchemists for like magic. So oh, wow. I just I just love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> it is in the rose family also. Edible leaves and flowers. I mean, you wouldn't really eat a leaf, but like you could make a tea with this. And this was commonly used for female complaints. So really oh, great oh, for like oh, menstrual ladies irregularities. Mantle. Ladies' mantle. Yes, yeah. exactly. So that's a really neat one. And then this is another aromatic one. It's in the um, it's Agastache, which is in the mint family. It has a really nice smell. It's just another nice kind of aromatic um, digestive herb. Hmm. 
So that's a good one to think about. Yeah, mints always have square stems. Yeah, yeah. If you're trying to figure out if something's in the mint family, you want to make sure it's going to have a square stem. This is a perfect example. And opposite oh. leaves, meaning they come, they arise in the stem oh. right opposite from each other. And then the flowers have very distinctive flowers too. So botanically, that's how plants are categorized by their flower. That's starting to change or starting to do like DNA testing to put plants into families, which is really confusing because we don't have DNA tests <laughs> over in the field. But for now, that is still how plants are um, you know, put into families botanically. So the mint family has this kind of tubular <laughs> flowers, like they're fused, like one is on the top and then one opens up like this. You know, it's kind of the spot, it's like a landing pad for pollinators. Oh. Yeah. Huh. And then the other two that I have here, they're, it's a little bit different. I've got violet and sorrel. So violet leaves, these are examples, these two, it's kind of a different direction. They're examples of potterbs. So has anyone heard of a potterb before? Yeah, but what does the term mean? Yeah, so a potterb is a word that was used to describe plants that went into the pot. Okay. So uh, a real traditional way of kind of cooking, um, certainly in sort of Renaissance times that went into, you know, sort of colonial times, is just a pot full of a lot of different, like, herbs. And you would use this as a base for soups and stews, and um, you would use the different pot herbs both, both for their nutritional value, but also <coughs> for flavoring. So, you know, it's really interesting because they used plants that we would never think of today to use. A great example of one that I couldn't find growing, which was like, Beard because it's everywhere is garlic mustard. Are you all familiar with garlic mustard? <laughs> Brought here by the colonists as a pot herb. That's why it's that's why it's here, and um, it's one of the absolute first plants to emerge in the spring, right? So it's a, it's like the earliest. It's the earliest spring green that emerges, and it's very pungent, very bitter, very nutritious. Um, you know, has a lot of different minerals and high in vitamin C. So literally that was like, you know, when the spring thaw came and you were like desperate for greens, garlic mustard, throw it in the pot and it makes a nice delicious pungent soup. Um, vegetarian bone broth. I love it, yes. No, totally, I'm all about that. I just actually was working with a client who was vegan and I was like, they really need bone broth, but instead we get a broth of like, um, medicinal mushrooms and oh, like seaweed yeah, and yeah. nourishing herbs. Yeah, yeah, totally. Sometimes you gotta do that. So that's essentially, yeah, it's a good example. So violet would have been used as a potter. Violet leaves, this is probably viola odorata, sweet violet. Again, not an endemic one, but we have many, many endemic species of violets in the woods here. But this is the one that grows in gardens and um, I'll pass that around. It has a heart-shaped um, leaf. And, and this is actually quite nutritious. Calcium. In the spring, we could. You can eat it. Yeah, really high in vitamin C. <laughs> vitamin A. Yes, violet leaves are quite edible. They. And feel free to try this if you want. It's just from the garden, but you know, if you don't want it, no worries. But it's. Um, they're a little bit demulcent, and demulcent means it contains mucilage, and so it gets a little bit slimy in your mouth. Actually, that's the mucilage. Okra. So a little bit like yes, okra is mucilage. Like yeah. Yes, okra also has the mucilage. So. Um, Anyway, your violet is a little bit moistening, which is really nice if you run drier. And as you get older, you start to run drier. And we're talking about like thin skin, you know, that's an example. So having the, that mucilage in your diet can actually help with that a little bit. But this is one that you could throw into a soup or stew. I like to put them in salads, and I don't, I wouldn't have like a whole salad of violet leaf because it can also be a little bit acrid, like in the back of your throat. Yeah. But I will like to make what I call wild salad, and it'll be about like half sort of mescaline greens and half wild greens. And another one that I would use for that is sorrel. So my kids call this sour heart. And when I pass it around, you'll see why they call it that. Um, and if you do feel like trying it, I really encourage you to, because it's really high in um, ascorbic acid, that the vitamin C, it's so sour. So that's why they call it sour hearts. But really nice and sour, the sour flavor also, if you can imagine sort of colonial fare, like lemons don't grow here naturally, so right? Like where do you get that sour flavor? Sorrel. Is, um, and again, this is one that was brought here by the colonists, whether intentionally or not. You know, a lot of these things were just kind of hitchhikers. It just kind of came along. I think I've been pulling this up out of my garden forever. Yeah, I have too. Yeah. You know, I have like the constant thing where like, I don't leave them all, but I always leave some. 
because they're really nice and soft. It's lemony. Yes, yeah. it's very lemony. And imagine a nice little kind of side sauce with that to go along with your meats or your mm -hmm. vegetables or something. Because now we can, you know, like I said, we have access to like citrus and stuff. But other forms of sour that are kind of from around here, there's not a whole lot. Um, there's rose hips, like those are sour, but there's not really a whole lot of that true sour tart. When we were growing up, there was something we called sour grass, but it was kind of like a tongue shape. But it wasn't that one? It wasn't Some people call that yeah. sour grass too. It, it was, um, well, like a tongue shape, but then it had two things that jutted out at where the. I'm not sure what that it. is. Yeah. I'm not I sure. Don't see Did you it. grow up around here? I grew up in New Jersey. Oh, and I okay. don't see it up here as yeah, much. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. But it was all over the place. That's cool. Here, so. That's really neat. It tasted very much like yeah. that, but it was thicker. Yeah, totally. Yes, you could put that as another potter, but that's just another way that the colonists worked with these plants that we call weeds, but they were they had kitchen gardens of. So when you cook so herbs, do they lose some of their nutritional they lose some, value? You know, minerals you can boil them as much as you want, and they just really will be extracted more. You know, bone broth is a great example of that. The longer you boil it, the more calcium comes out of the bone. But vitamins can be, like vitamin C is diminished by heat. Right. But a lot of these things are so rich in vitamin C that even though you lose some from the heat, you still have a lot. Okay. So, yeah. But with vitamins, generally fresh is better. But What can you eat along with turnips that make you forget that you're eating turnips? <laughs> I would just like, totally. Yeah, yeah. I love, the, I love all the culinary herbs in the mint family. So for me, I love like rosemary okay. and with them. Um, with turnips, it's like I'll just turnip carrot mash. And it's yeah, that is pretty good actually. It's like and you just, you know, so just get that some, tank. yeah, and like some rosemary powder with some salt and black pepper. Basically, the adage that we always say in herbalism is don't eat boring food, meaning you put spices <laughs> on things. It doesn't spices not to mean cayenne. Hmm. Right. Well, thank Great. you Thanks very so much. much.